afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Here's uh, Helsinki calling here, and uh, JB, my my old colleague, sitting hello, in Lithuania. Yes. yes. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to. Uh, Welcome to this this webinar, and uh, happy to see so so many of you. And uh, you know, we'll wait a little bit until everybody is, or not everybody, or at least we'll wait a little bit till a few more have, have arrived. But we're of course uh, we're also curious to see who it is that we have today. So um, let's see. Well, I put I pushed a little poll here, and let's see what what kind of uh, what kind of role that you have, and uh, very curious to see. And uh, maybe we do have a few lawyers in the room. Who knows? Let's see. Let's see. Tell what us who you there. are. Tell us who you sales. are, exactly. Oh, nice. I really like those polls. So, salespeople, mainly so far, marketing. Huh? Nice. Excellent. Okay. Uh -huh. 50 -50 Everybody now. A bit 50-50, but I mean, in that sense, every, everything is connected, right? I mean, uh, yeah. if uh, if marketing is not doing their job, then sales can't, and vice versa. Uh, it's a uh, it's a good thing that everybody is uh, is thinking about this and and, and uh, looking uh, looking to work with it. So good to see, nice nice number. Yeah. I see no lawyers, or maybe you are hiding. That could be as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll close the poll now. Thank you very much. And good to see what we have on on board here. So let's let's properly introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Peter, and uh, I'm here. I'm the customer success lead here at uh, at Leadfeeder, and uh, in my work with the. Uh, with the wonderful one, yeah, with the wonderful GDPR in the last uh, couple of months or many months, actually, I've uh, of course had to answer many questions along the way, uh, and also just in general, I had to familiarize myself. I was very much hoping to uh, to give you the great news that I'm actually certified in this stuff as well, uh, but unfortunately, there was something wrong with my exam and uh, things didn't quite work out as uh, as planned. So, no luck just yet. So, I'll be more studying over summer. Uh, and actually hoping that, that the mess can fix. But either way, welcome. We're here to help you get the most, of course, out of uh, out of the GDPR, your B2B context. And uh, afterwards, I'll talk a little bit also about how uh, particular examples that can help you while using uh, Leadfeed itself. But I will leave it over to, to uh, JB here and uh, mm -hmm. talk to talk on, on this stuff. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you uh, for you know, putting this up, it's uh, great to talk uh, to everyone here today uh, with uh, Peter and uh, with Litfeeder. So my name is Jean Baptiste, but you can call me JB. It's much easier, and uh, you also save a lot of time pronouncing my name, um, calling me JB. Right? I, I come from B2B sales. We used to work together back in time uh, with Peter at Trustpilot, and today I work with VC accelerators in the in the Baltic uh, regions where we help um, B2B sales startup to go to the market in a data-driven way. And yes, today we're going to talk about, obviously we were super concerned about this whole GDPR thing since it, it does actually impact how you need to um, adapt your B2B sales process when you contact people and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so before we get started, we have a boring slide about um, the fact that we are not lawyers, right? And we are just marketers, and we need just to show you this. Uh, so, if you really want to have a bulletproof, uh, let's say, B2B sales process or whatever, you of course need to get legal consults, which uh, I personally did uh, for our companies. And of course, um, I highly recommend that you do the same, right? Um, anything to add on your side, Peter, from this part? No, no, not at all. I mean, we uh, we we have been working with this, of course, for many months. So we we have some pretty good insights, uh, that which of course we'll we try to share as much as we can. I mean, about a month ago, we had another webinar on on, on GDPR things, but uh, yeah, if really find some proper legal advice, uh, but where we can, of course, we we, mm -hmm. we share our experiences. And that's how that is. So exactly. over to you, maybe. Thank you. Great, and this is the agenda for today, um, for the workshops, for the webinar. So at first, so we're gonna talk very briefly about who we are, so Leadfeeder and Evergrowth, what, what we do, some key figures, why we are legit to talk about all this. And then eventually we're gonna dig into the GDPR part. 
So, you know, there are some best practice when you do presentations where usually they tell you you need to have 30 slides, uh, no, 20, 10 slides with no more uh, than 20 minutes and on every slide, every single font should be at least 30 so everyone can read. So unfortunately, because it's GDPR, we have some slides with a lot of text. So I'm just, you know, setting expectation up front uh, when we're going to go to this part of the presentation. Um, and then eventually we're going to share these uh, slides as a PDF afterwards. And that's why I included the deliverable part where you're going to get some templates and some link to download some guidelines. If you want to dig further, it's a 20 pages guideline, if I remember correctly, with some uh, workflow and some flowcharts and so on and so forth, right? So let's get started. So we already told you a bit about who we are, uh, but I guess a little bit more um, very briefly about you know our companies. So back to you, Peter. Yeah, so not, not all of you know us uh, just yet, but uh, most of you do, of course, but still just to set the scene. So what we do is basically sit on top of your, your Google Analytics and uh, we try to show you what our pros what prospects and customers do on your website. Uh, and what we want to help with is optimizing your lead management, your lead qualification process along the way. And through that, plugging into loads and loads of things. So of course, because we are sitting on so much data or that we have to have our hands in so much data, this is why this topic is specifically uh, relevant for us. Over to you, JB. Great, thank you. And what we do at Evergrowth, so we come from the VC kind of industry, venture capital, where we help early stage companies. So basically we help companies with seed funding and bridge round at the beginning. The main idea here when you're super early stage is to go to the market. So at this stage, when it comes to b 2 sales, it's very, very, very common that you get your first customers from your own network and your kind of second degree connection network that just keep on you know, introducing you to other customers. And we always say that you, if you start a business and you're not able to get your first customers from your own kind of network, you're probably in the wrong business, right? Um, and then now, once we have reached this stage, the main goal is to basically help companies to repeat their success with the sales uh, and achieve what we call product market fit, right? Then if you want to continue or if you're on a VC journey, uh, that's when we start raising bigger rounds. And if we are doing well, we start having what we like to call good problems. So you need to scale, optimize. And if you are lucky enough, you can even consider an exit. So everyone is happy, right? And when we are at this stage, I always like to like to, um, to ask the audience, let's say in terms of stage with your company, where the first stage A is like when you get your first customers, the B stage is like you have already quite a few uh, numbers of customers and it's all about scaling the business. And C is like later stage company where you're already optimized. So if you could you know, um, use the poll to give you um, some feedback about which stage you are, and I might be able as well to adapt, maybe share some example according to your stage to a bit later on during the presentation. Great, so I can see the poll moving. So we have quite a few early stage uh, startups. Uh, now it's moving a little bit, so that's great. Very, very nice. Great, so you, I guess you can keep on answering the poll and I can just move on and see approximately what kind of stage we have in, in, the, in the audience. And um, yeah, so some key figures. Uh, so why we are super concerned about the GDPR is because on a you know daily basis we are basically building list of companies for the com for the clients we are working with. So companies that match the ideal customer profile, and we enrich those companies with contacts, right? And then we outreach these contacts. We send together with our clients approximately two thousand cold emails per week, and I mean even more today. Actually, to be honest, this number is definitely outdated. And our reply rate of our campaign is between 25 to 66%. And we are booking together with our customer over 100 meetings per week. And these are some key clients' achievements that we are very proud to share. So uh, with some clients after, of course, working for more than nine months, but after working with them for some time and putting a predictable pipeline uh, data-driven uh, workflow in place, we succeeded in nine months to generate $10 million of revenue. And from other startup, we grew 1,000 person in the years when we were moving from this A to B stage and starting to scale the machine, right? So this is pretty much what we do. And moving forward with like the agenda, this is how we look at the B2B sales, right? So if all of you were in sales and marketing, this is not something like totally new at all to you, but just to make sure we align on the terms we use. So when we say outbound, it means you need to go out to find your customers. And obviously you need to find the companies, you need to find people, you need to contact these people see if there is a pain, and if this discover if there is a pain when you book the meeting. 
And uh, during the meeting, uh, agree if this pain match with your painkiller, which is your product, and that's when we agree that there is a fit and you close the deal, right? So this is pretty much the, the way we do outbound sales. And um, a lot of um, companies, uh, people are telling about, you know, how you can automate outbound sales and how much, uh, how can artificial intelligence can help and so on and so forth. I think we are very, very far to have uh, everything automated. However, uh, you can systemize it because it's a very systematic type of work, right? So we talk about system when we do outbound. And then, of course, inbound, uh, you can have great tools like a lead feeder to help you uh, enrich and qualify, pre-qualify maybe at the top of your funnel. And you can automate way more uh, stuff uh, with the content, the lead generation, and so on. And in that case, you don't need to find the company. You don't need to find the people. They don't need to contact them because they already come to you. And in the best case scenario, they have a pain that match your painkiller. And today we're going to talk about GDPR for outbound, right? And while a um, few parts of maybe this presentation can apply for uh, inbound, if you read the GDPR, these are actually two different articles. So when it comes to outbound, it's article 14. And when it comes to inbound, it's article 13. And the main difference is the opt-in, right? So we're going to talk about this uh, a bit later, but if you want to compare, uh, obviously, you can go directly to Article 13 for inbound and maybe some other one. And then in outbound, everything is mostly covered in Article 4. And, and then go, go a bit, little bit more into details and um, how we look at the B2B sales funnels. Uh, we always like to look at the B2B sales funnels from that perspective, where we have basically the time and the value you had at the different stage of your process. And we had it, the GDPR on the top. So, at first, you start with your ideal customer profile, right? That we call ICPs. Um, with, once you are done with your ideal customer profile, you kind of generate uh, or estimate, let's say, your total addressable market that you can reach for each ICP. You start doing some list building. Um, unfortunately, we never found a database or a place to scrape over the web where no matter how good our robots were to do the scraping, we had 100% of those companies that were matching our ICP. So that's what we call the list pre-qualification. Um, and then eventually you, need, you do the leads enrichment. And that's when GDPR starts really applying, meaning that you look for the contact, you look for the emails, you look for their phone numbers and so on and so forth, right? Then you contact them. So GDPR applies again, definitely to that part. And then obviously then your goal, if you're in sales at this stage, you're not selling yet, but you just want, like we said before, you want to touch a pain point and eventually agree that you want to have a meeting, right? And then all the value added part happens here, right? So now you're having the meeting, you are following up, sending offers and so on and so forth, right? And then when you close them, another journey starts, which is the customer success journey. And of course, if you want to be up to date with uh, kind of your total addressable market on your sales process, you need to update your CRM. And then of course, uh, that means that you will process personal data in your CRM and GDPR also applies there. And we often in B2B SaaS, like uh, software as a service companies, we separate those uh, three roles into data research, outreach rep, or they are also called BDR or SDR these days on account executive or sales rep. And let's say the um, GDPR will apply mainly to those two roles uh, or those two parts of the test process, right? So the blue and the, and the black, the beginning of the black part, right? So moving forward with the agenda, we're going to use some terms that actually come from the GDPR. So we're going to use uh, the term personal data, obviously. And when, it, when it, for, on, in the context of outbound sales, what it means, it means the full name, the job title, the email, obviously, even if it's a work email, it is personal data because it does contain the first name or the last name or, and, and it is personal data information. The phone number is, is very questionable, but do not be risky. We will assume that their personal work phone number might be considered a personal data. We are just minimizing the risk. Um, processing means, for example, that you are collecting their personal data in your CRM. This is how we see uh, this definition. The controller is your company. The processor is a service provider. So a CRM is a processor um, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you use a G Suite for business, they are a processor. And that's why you got all those great um, DPA to sign like data processing agreement uh, from many uh, different tools, right? The data subject in the context of outbound is the, um, your prospect, basically the lead that you want to contact. The consent in GDPR is freely given, so you, and they need to be fully aware of the processing purpose, right? And has to be, they talk a lot about transparency in the GDPR uh, document in the, in the legislation. Uh, direct marketing is, there is no definition in the GDPR um, documentation in the, in the registration, 
but this is what we consider as cold sales outreach, and this is also how they kind of uh, phrase it in many different examples. A data protection officer is the person in charge in your company therefore when it comes to all the personal um, data subject matter and yeah so this is what we're going to use in terms of definition now of course the first question that every single salesperson i work with uh, ask me when it comes to gdpr is if i find someone on linkedin i guess their email address um, can i just contact them without their consent right and the question is um, Yes, you can. So do I need to get their consent before you contact them? Is no. And um, we have um, a small detail on this, so we'll get back to this. Uh, but at the beginning of the text of the GDPR, you have what you call a recital. So these are bullet points. And in recital 47, this, it clearly says that the processing of personal data for direct marketing purpose may be regarded as legitimate interest. And basically, when you have a legitimate interest, you do not need to ask for the consent to contact these people, right? However, they clearly say may, and they also, in the same recital, tell you that at any rate of existence, the legitimate interest can be questioned, right? So this is the pretty much what this other part of the recital says. So that's why it's not like you can basically buy some kind of a random list of contact and send them random emails. You need to make sure that you have a legitimate interest and to be able to prove that these companies actually match your ideal customer profile and they have a, you have a legitimate to contact them because your other customers look exactly like them. This is what we will interpret uh, ourselves as a outbound sales, as direct marketing marketer, uh, inter, uh, as a legitimate interest. So moving forward, we will explain you how to document your legitimate interest to make sure that there is no misunderstanding um, for that part, right? Uh, but let's say the main takeaway from this part is you can, it's very, very, very risky if you buy some kind of random email database to send um, your uh, promotion emails to some people that didn't give you their consent because in that case, your legitimate inter interest can be definitely questioned, right? Moving forward with the second questions, I must ask question uh, regarding GDPRs and outbound sales is, does the data subject have rights if I process his or her personal data for direct marketing purpose? And of course, uh, the answer is yes. And you will see like most of the articles are coming from the article 14, but this one here is 15. So they have the right um, of access by the data subject. So meaning they can at any time uh, ask you to access their data. So um, the meaning that they can basically ask to get an extract of their data from your CRM. They have the right to do that. Um, this right is a bit funny in the, the outbound uh, context. It does apply to, um, to the GDPR as well. They have the right to rectify the data, meaning that they could basically ask you, um, do uh, can I change my job title? Like I got promoted, please update it in your CRM. According to GDPR, they have the right to do this. I really doubt anyone will do that, but this is uh, some right that they have. Um, moving forward, they of course have the right to, of erasure to be forgotten. Uh, that, so that's coming back a lot in many different articles in the GDPR and many different recitals. Um, and I understand where it's coming from with all the you know uh, different big, big internet companies that might not make it very transparent that you can actually be forgotten. And there is a loop in the B2B sales funnel where this article doesn't make sense and we will um, get back to it at the end of the presentation, uh, but they have this right. Um, they have the right to restrict the processing. So basically this one means that if they want to question your legitimate interest, they can just say, please keep my data and I'm just gonna question your legitimate interest with the um, legit whatever authority in my region. Uh, so please, uh, we know you restrict the processing and we just, um, uh, going to ask authority to basically say who is right or not, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, you need to notify them every time they ask uh, something, which is um, they express one of their rights. You need to notify that you have received, and you need to basically tell them as well if, how, and when you honor their right. So if they tell you, please stop, um, um, please update my data, or please send me my data, you need to basically confirm and obviously send it to them. And of course, uh, Article 21, they have the right to object, uh, which is just, that just means I'm not interested, right? But according to GDPR, now you need to be even more careful than before and make sure you do, do not contact these people anymore, right? Because from that moment on, according to the GDPR, they objected, so you should not contact them anymore. 
Good. I'm moving forward. So for this question alone, I have three slides. Um, and I have, in the second part of the presentation, we have one part that is dedicated exactly to that part. So do I need to inform the data subject about his or her right uh, when if I process the, their personal data basically for direct marketing purpose? And yes, you need to. And there is quite a lot of uh, things that you need to tell them. So um, you need to inform them about the identity and the contact details of the controllers is basically who is your company. Um, if applicable, you need to give the contact details of the data protection officer. So in the example we will share later, this will not be applicable. Uh, but if you do it another way, this might be applicable. Um, the purpose of the processing for the personal data. So in your case, you need to tell them that uh, this is the details of a company and we uh, process your personal data for direct marketing. Uh, this is the purpose, right? Um, and this one is related uh, basically to the other one. Um, if, it's, if the purpose is related to legitimate interest, you need to name the legitimate interest. So in our case, it's direct marketing. You have different legitimate interest. In that case, it's direct marketing. Uh, the categories of the personal data. So basically, it's what we saw um, in the definition slide. So the category most of the time will concern the full name, uh, the emails, the job title. Um, if you have their phone, it might concern the phone, and so on and so forth. And then the period for which the personal data will be stored, or if that's not possible, the criteria used to determine that period. So you need to tell them, um, obviously, in a simple way, uh, what is the criteria to store their data in the CRM, right? Um, and you need to tell that when you contact them for the first time, right? So the existing, uh, and then you need, basically, this article, this point in the article, what it says is you need to inform them about how they can request um, rectification, erasure of the personal data. And uh, you need to tell them that they also have the right to lodge a complaint to the supervisory uh, authority. And finally, if you got their source uh, from some kind of public data, you need also to tell them where you found uh, their, um, their personal data, from which source. And the last slide uh, about this question, if, they are used, uh, if you use the personal data to communicate with them, you need to inform them from the first uh, point of contact, right? So from your first communication, if you do cold call, you need to inform them during your cold call. If you do cold email, during your cold email, right? Um, and this is just, again, a recital. So it's one of the points that is at the beginning of the text. And this kind of re like sum up everything uh, that was in those uh, uh, three slides where personal data are processed for the purpose of direct marketing, should have the right to object, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, you, can, you can read uh, all, the, all the slides again afterwards, but basically this recital just sums up uh, all the uh, other points that we had before that. So it's quite a lot of stuff that you need to inform the data subject about when you are processing their personal data. And then, of course, we have a process that we're going to share uh, in, the, in the other slides of this presentation and how to basically adapt your search process to make sure that you do all that, right? And then the question number four is, do I need to document my internal process? So obviously you need to. If not, you might be in trouble when you want to basically apply all the recommendations to the question three. So what we recommend is to document your legitimate interest. Because again, at any time, uh, your legitimate interest might be a question. And if you define your ideal customer profile, if you have dedicated fields in your CRM that basically systemize this homework, like, like this company match this ICP, and that's why, um, so but when I say ICP, I mean ideal customer profile, right? So when this company match your ICP and so on and so forth, so you could basically, if your um, legitimate interest is a uh, question, you could basically show that um, you did all the homework that uh, basically uh, from your perspective documents your legitimate interest. When you process the personal data, you need to be able to store somewhere in your CRM, uh, CRM system where uh, and what are the sources of where you collected this data. Of course, you need to double check and triple check that all the tools you use to process those data, this personal data, uh, is actually compliant to GDPR. So that's why you got all this uh, DPA, a data processing agreement from the different tools you use. Um, and of course, if applicable, it's always nice to have flowcharts and so on and so forth. I mean, with all the lawyers I actually had discussion with uh, regarding GDPRs, everyone is talking about that what the authority would like to see is the good intention that you did your best to follow the GDPR, right? And if you have this type of process, this is pretty much what it will show and that it was transparent and there is no kind of uh, um, mean to hurt anyone in your process. You just want to be nice and inform people and follow the regulation, right? 
And then of course the data subject, right? So every one, one of the every time one of the data subjects tells you stop contacting me, or they object to the to the they expect their right to object to the to the outreach um, or to the process of the personal data, or if they request the erasure, you need to have a process in place that is transparent and when you can basically honor every single request. Uh, and of course, we are um, you know system geek here, so we will systemize this part of the process and so on and so forth, right? And finally, the last question, so do I need to follow the GDPR regulation if my organization is based outside of the EU? Of course, it's yes, because um, it's all about the EU data subject and not about the organization. And if pretty much this article sums it up, so if your organization is located in a place where the EU laws apply by the virtue of public international law. So basically, maybe if you are in North Korea, uh, you don't need to follow the GDPR, right? because the EU laws do not really apply in, in North Korea. But I think if you are based somewhere else, you most likely you need to follow the GDPR, right? I'm just kidding, of course, but uh, the point here is it concerns the EU data subject, right? So it's not about where the, the company is located. <laughs> nice comment, Dorin. Recital 47 is the reason uh, I still have food on the table. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, focusing back on the slide. So data processing. So this is the part one. So in this part, we're going to talk about how you need to adapt your sales process to basically process personal data in your CRM and make sure that you are compliant and you can, when you outreach, basically be compliant again, right? So I'm not going to go uh, like in super details on how to set up your CRM, but just to keep it uh, more like theoretical. Most of the CRMs are set up the same way. You have three main elements. So you have companies where you have default fields like country, and then you can add custom fields like ICP on ICP type. So again, ICP stands for ideal customer profile. Um, then according to your sales process, you might have different tasks uh, according to different parts of your workflow. And let's say when you find a company that matches your ICP, you want to add a contact, so people in the CRM, and then you have some default fields where the GDPR uh, basically directly applies because those fields are designed to process personal data. Uh, so we have email, we have uh, status, which are the stage, so you might have here a stage do not contact if they basically tell you like, I object to your, your processing or please do not contact me again, and you need to make sure that you never contact people again to respect the GDPR, and so on and so forth. We also have some custom fields where we have the GDPR source. So I have another slide where we share uh, different templates on where and how we collect their, so, uh, their, so we basically systemize that part. And then this is more like our own uh, process, but we always categorize people as well by expertise and type. And this could be also some more, let's say, legitimate interest uh, process, saying that we usually work with customers that have expertise marketing or expertise sales, and that are type decision maker or influencer. And the reason we started doing this was way before GDPR, just for the full story. We started doing this because we are like very data-driven sales uh, consulting company and organization in general. And when we started to make a report uh, with, you know, pie chart of job title, it just was in all over the place, right? There is no pattern across organization about job titles. And then when we started to categorize job title into expertise, so if you are a marketing uh, director or a growth guru or um, or some kind of uh, CMO, your expertise is marketing. And if you are, you know, VP, then you are director, uh, or VP or director, you are decision maker. And if you are manager or executive, you might be influencer according to the size of your company. So this is how we use these two uh, fields. And this might be also useful for legitimate interest. And then finally, there is nothing here that will apply to the GDPR, but just to kind of get the full picture of how the CRM looks like. You have default fields with uh, what well, we have a deal or opportunity according to what CRM you use. And obviously at this stage, you have already uh, talked and agreed with the contact that uh, there is a legitimate interest to do business together and no, no, nothing apply here to the GDPR, right? And then if we follow the same uh, process, um, that the same workflow we looked at earlier, so we uh, start with the list building. And in the list building, um, in order to add those steps, we need to document our ideal customer profile. So how we usually do that is we have different profile for uh, each um, ICP, um, where we have a part about the company. So it's, you know, 90% of what we're gonna talk here is pure common sense. So you categorize them by regions, verticals, which, is a, which, which can be a group of industries. So an example, if, if you work with e-commerce, uh, the industry might be e-commerce, internet, or, re or retail, or whatever. 
And then you have subcategories, like for example, the biggest uh, vertical in e-commerce is travel, then you probably have electronics or fashion and so on and so forth, right? Um, um, Oliver, we're going to talk, I just see some question on the chat, it was a big one. So we're going to talk about this uh, probably, blah, 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 for example, on my LinkedIn. Uh, I think we're going to talk about this question uh, later in the presentation, so I'll just uh, keep going. And then uh, regarding the ICP, so regarding the size, um, here's just again some best practice on how we can do your ICP, but according to what you sell, the size of the company might have different impact, and it has to be related to the size of the deals, the size of the offers you send to those companies. So basically, if you sell a CRM software or if you sell a software where you sell a number of users, I mean, the model to price the software is based on the number of users, number of employees will be more important to you, but if you sell as a tool to e-commerce shop, Maybe the traffic will be more interesting, so Alexa ranking might be more relevant. And if you sell, let's say, a tool for mobile apps developers, then the number of downloads might be more relevant related to the number of users and so on and so forth. So you get it. Um, what is more important, obviously, for the GDPR when it comes to the ideal customer profile is the people, right? So when we do um, ideal customer profile, we um, we always focus on, on the KPIs of the decision maker, influencers, and, um, our, uh, and also we have the champion. And how it works is obviously decision makers have, obviously most of the time, they have KPIs that are oriented more towards the bottom line of the business, so sales, uh, the new leads, uh, profit and loss, and so on and so forth. And then they have influencers working for them that are more hands-on in the business and doing the, the basically the task. And when we do B2B sales, we always focus on KPIs because even though it's B2B, people still buy for personal reason. They will buy for a personal reason that you will make their KPIs easier, right? And, and that's it. And of course, when we do outbound, we never document the champion that basically works in the influencer because then it means you will need to sell from the bottom to the top twice. But we always have the, the champion in our profile because um, most of the time when an inbound lead is coming to you, it's a champion that basically looks for information about the internet. Yeah, this champion finds great information on your website, on your blog, and then can find something interesting that makes him feel uh, important in the next meeting where he or she goes, right? Uh, so obviously, of course, we won't ignore the champion, uh, but when we do outbound, we mainly focus on contacting decision maker and influencer. And how we decide about this is we basically um, categorize the strengths of your value proposition of your product in three categories. So we have the painkiller. A painkiller product, according to us, is a product that generates directly ROI for your company. So um, I sell you a tool, and within two months, you generate already 10,000 euro of sales, and my tool was 5,000 euro. Uh, euro. So the ROI is super clear, and in that case, when you have a painkiller product, you can contact the decision maker. Um, a vitamin is also a great product, but it basically helps the influencer to do a very specific task in, let's say, one hour instead of uh, one day, right? And this uh, type of tool, you cannot pitch it to the decision maker because the decision maker are not hands on with the task, so they won't get it, right? Uh, which is perfectly fine. There is plenty of vitamin products out there. You just need to have a sales process where you have a step where the, the basically the Influencer become your champion. You build a case together that you need to present and you agreed on to present it to the decision maker, right? And then obviously a plugin is a product that does not generate uh, new uh, sales or directly have ROI impact, does not really save directly time for the influencer and is more nice to have product, right? That's what we call a plugin. And then of course, just to finish the, um, how we do ideal customer profile, we always include deal breaker. So deal breaker is for example, if you sell cloud software, uh, SaaS uh, software, uh, software as a service. Um, one of the typical deal breakers, especially if, um, especially if we have, um, like say, software that we sell to large bank or insurance companies, it's very, very typical that they will ask you, "Great, how can I, um, how can I host this software on my cloud?" and if you basically did not talk about this with the influencer or other decision maker, and then the CTO comes at the end and asks, great, this is great software, show me how to put it on your cloud, and you don't, you, are, you cannot do that, then you basically lost the deal and wasted every one time. So we have deal breakers, it's just some checkpoint that we need to check with other companies. When you sell some time hardware, you need to make sure that there is a strong Wi-Fi connection or stuff like that, right? And then switching cost is also very important to talk about is when you sort of use your solution or your product or your services, companies need to switch from something. 
And this involves um, painting the picture on how the decision maker or how you will help influencer or decision maker to bring other decision, other influencer into the same product and to make sure that this influencer will not become your anti champion. This here, the um, example I always like to take to kind of explain the, um, the switching cost is if I sell a CRM system, then the CMO and the um, and the sales director are basically the decision makers. And let's say I have 20 salespeople that are influencer. Both the CMO and the sales director, they both love the CRM. They both see that it's much better and they can work much better together as well. Um, however, I have 20 influencer, 20 salespeople that use another CRM every day. And even though my CRM is cheaper, this is a huge switching cost, right? And in, in, to remove the switching cost, I will have a sales process that basically help me to do personal onboarding, and personal training, and move the data, and so on and so forth. So this is what we call switching costs. And this is not related to GDPR, it's just more like the best practice of the ICP, and this is more related to you know, B2B. Um, but I will have this to basically categorize uh, my, when I do list building. And, and to question later. Oops. Okay, your connection has been refreshed. Uh... Hello? Sorry I'm about back. that. It's okay. Did you kick me out? <laughs> No, no, no. I think we just uh, just froze one of those. All right. No, Sorry no about that, everyone. It's okay. All right, I'm back. So I was just saying, moving forward with the, the presentation, if you want to learn more on how we do ideal customer profile, you can download our, our free guidelines uh, and just you know uh, take it from there. It includes uh, templates on how we do this and so on and so forth. So now moving back to the to the GDPR and what we mean by ICP, um, we uh, just. We'll start looking at the second step. So you have your list and you need to pre-qualify those companies, right? So here is a simple workflow that you can actually use. Uh, and what it does is very simple. So you assign tasks in your CRM. Then you check if the company is ICP. When there is a plus, it means there is a sub-process. So you can document that stage uh, further. And then you basically choose the field if it's ICP, yes or no. If it's no, you just you know end the task and complete. If it's yes, then um, you basically look for comp, you select the ICP type, you look for the ideal, um, um, you look for the ideal contact, and eventually, if you find the contact, you say that it's ICP yes, qualify stage, you select what type of ICP, and so on and so forth, right? Um, this is pretty much how we do this. And then again, here the link to the GDPR is not directly related, right? Because you do not yet process personal data. However, what you are doing here is your doc you document your legitimate interest. Okay, um, and then the second part uh, of, I mean, the last part of the list building is when you do the leads enrichment, right? So when I say leads enrichment, I'm not gonna show you how to guess emails and so on. I guess you can Google that. There is plenty of information over the web on what tools you can use like hunter.io or, or, or whatever other tools um, to basically guess emails and, and, and find the personal, um, also personal information like phone number of those uh, companies, uh, people. But obviously this is when you start processing personal data on the GDPR directly apply, right? So like we said, uh, this stage is for later, but um, later, sorry, but this is where, for example, you have the stage like that you want to contact them. This is when you start putting their email, their full name, their job title in the CRM. And this is when as well you start collecting the data collection like source. So you, this is where you start storing where you found their personal information, right? And for the GDPR source, so for this part, this is what we basically recommend, is to have a drop-down menu in your CRM. And this drop-down menu will basically come when you do your first uh, email outreach, and you will have a disclaimer at the bottom of your email, which says, following the GDPR, you are hereby informed that your personal data was found on your, and then you have the different scenarios of your list building. On your LinkedIn profile, on your email address was guessed based on your company email structure, which was publicly available and so on and so forth. Then you have a scenario where you have the, everything on the company website, then a bit of hybrid scenario, and so on and so forth. And then other scenarios will go like this, like you send emails and then on the out of office reply or automatic reply from their colleague or from their self, you get their full name or job title. 
Um, the same different scenarios will apply when um, you just get the full name and email, not the job title and so on and so forth, right? And then obviously here, it's all about creating as many patterns as possible that you can select every time you enter a new contact in the CRM because you always need to inform the, person, the data subject on where you uh, basically collected their information. And what we include in this, um, in this um, custom field in the CRM is we include the category of the data. You see full name, job title, and email is a category. And we also include the source. So we actually cover two articles of the GDPR in, uh, in this custom field entry, right? And here is the full, basically, process and where you have the companies and how you process and how you check if the company is ICP or not, right? And you have the second part of the process, which is related to how, you, when you start adding people in your CRM, you add new contact and start processing the personal data, right? And the link, obviously, to the GDPR here is directly related. Um, because you are person, well, you are processing the personal data, and you want to make sure that you collect the information to be compliant uh, with the direct marketing, and show that you have a legitimate interest to contact them for the direct marketing purpose, right? So going back to question three and the article uh, fourteen point two, and now how do we contact them and make sure we are compliant, right? So obviously. Um, what the GDPR says, and this was in the question three again, where the where we had like those three slides, uh, you need to make sure that you follow the GDPR and inform your data subject about his or her right in your first outreach. Uh, so what we recommend is basically to have an email disclaimer. Um, and this is pretty much uh, the one that we use today with all the companies we work with. Uh, just to walk you through it, uh, this is maybe not visible, but it's super important that you have your address. Because remember, in the um, question number three, you need to give them the, the full details about your company. So now in your email signature, you need to have your address. Um, then following the GDPR, blah, 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 we basically inform you that your um, personal data was found on your, and this is, again, what we looked at in the slide before. This is where we include the category of the personal data and the source of where we found this personal data. And then we tell them the purpose, so um, what we do with the data. It's so it was manually processed in our CRM for direct marketing purpose. We tell them that they have the right to lodge a complaint. So according to the GDPR, you have the right to lodge a complaint to supervisory authority. However, we tell them that direct marketing is a legitimate interest which doesn't require their consent. So it's more, you know, like, again, confirming. And we basically also educate them on the consent part here. And then we tell them, what is the process and how, how, for how long we will store their personal data? And if not applicable, what is the process behind it? So we tell them that the data is stored in our CRM and will not be processed for any other purpose than direct marketing. And finally, we inform them about their rights. So according to the, for, uh, to the GDPR, they have three rights. They can object to any further processing um, for their personal data for direct marketing pur purpose. And we inform them that if they do that, we will update our CRM immediately and we will guarantee that we do not contact them again. They can request a copy, and of course, they can request full erasure. Um, and we tell them, this is also according to the GDPR, what is the process, the transparent way, an easy way, blah, 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 to express their right. So basically, to express their right, we just tell them that they just basically need to reply to this email with the number of the right they want to basically apply to exercise. So if I do not, if I want you to stop contacting me, I just reply one. If I want, um, to erase my data and also get a copy, I reply two and three, right? And we are not doing this for over a month, so it's actually, it, it actually works. Like people, I mean, prospects are actually replying with one, two, or three. Um, so I was very surprised myself, but they do read this uh, disclaimer. Then the pros and cons of this type of uh, disclaimer is, of course, it is compliant to the GDPR according to our understanding, and it offers a very simple and painless process for the data subject to basically express their request. And the format is also very simple in terms of process internally. If I get a reply with one, I just put the status in my CRM, do not contact, and that's it, done. But then, of course, the cons is it's very not sexy to have this big, fat piece of text at the bottom of your email, right? Um, but, you know, uh, you need to do some compromise. Another example will be to have a process like that, where a disclaimer like that, where you have the same GDPR, and then you tell them that they can follow this link that sends them to another form where they basically have the same text uh, and they can just you know, select the right and so on and so forth, right? Um, 
However, the cons with this one is, let's say, yes, okay, this is six year at the bottom of your email. Um, and if you have the technical capacity, you might even do some API integration integrated with your CRM and so forth. But if you do not have that, you have actually extra steps in your sales process because you basically need to uh, delete the information in your CRM and, and you need also to delete the information, for example, in the, the, or update the information in this form where you collect the personal data as well because it will be stored there as well. And then you need to have some kind of reminder and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it basically creates more wiggle room to make mistakes and you might want to avoid it and keep it simple, right? But then it's up to you. And then, of course, the key question that I get very often is what about cold calling? Um, so, the, the, like, how do I inform people about, um, about all this information that I put in my disclaimer? And I think it's a very, very, very tricky question. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, there is, um, in the article uh, for, uh, 14, there is the point number five that says, if the provision of such information is proved to be impossible or will involve disproportionate efforts, then you do not need to inform them. But I think it's very, very difficult to basically prove that it was disproportionate. Like your prospect might say, no, it was not. I was there, I was listening, and I was waiting to be informed about my right, and I'm sure they did not do it. And uh, just, you know, to avoid any kind of... Um, misunderstanding we basically recommend to first send an email and this is according to gdpr this is the first uh, point of contact this is the first uh, outreach and then eventually you can do a warm let's say call call follow-up right um, but it's, it's still a gray area because let's say even if you do it very honestly um like and you do tell them all their rights how do you document it how do you prove that you actually did it right and then it's you might tell me that you might yeah i will uh, i will actually um, I will actually record the, the, the call, but then you also need to inform them about, you know, that you record the call. So, by the way, I'm recording this call, and these are your rights, right? And then you talk five minutes about their rights and not about your call. So I think call calling is a big question mark in, in uh, still according to the GDPR. But again, the trick is you first send a cold email with a, your product following the best practice of cold emailing and so on and so forth. And then eventually you do a follow-up call call. Okay. Um, the controller should be obliged, yeah. Okay, and now the, the last part is um, honoring the data subject request. So according to the recital, recital 59, the controller should be obliged to respond to the request from the data subject and so on and so forth. So basically, it's kind of logical, this is pure common sense, is if one of the data subject basically wants to express uh, their request, you need to honor their request. And here is a very simple process that you can use internally. This is the data subject here, and this is you they submit a request. So they reply to your email or to, or, or to your call, and they basically, you need to qualify the request because they might not just reply by one, two, three, and if they tell you stop contacting me, it basically means that they object to the processing. So in that case, you need to update your CRM and confirm that you updated the CRM. They might submit another request, and if so, you follow the same process, and if not, this is kind of over. Uh, so, and so on and so forth for the other type of um, uh, rights that they have, so personal data copy and personal data erasure, right? Um, good. And then here are some templates that we suggest to use. So, for example, uh, use case number one, they object. So you confirm as per your request, I by confirm that um, your status has been updated and we will not contact you anymore and so on and so forth, right? Uh, template number two, where you basically share their personal uh, data and the CSV file. Uh, according to the GDPR, it has to be on a machine readable format. Um, and then eventually, this is the tricky part. If they basically tell you to remove their data, and you remember you have this super neat process where you basically keep on looking for companies that match your ICP and so on and so forth, their personal uh, data will basically be out of your CRM. And this is basically what you tell them in, in, uh, in the middle. It's like, per your request, you need to honor the request. So you cannot just try to explain it and keep the data in your CRM. You need to honor it. So you confirm as per your request. I hereby confirm that your personal data was fully removed. Um, note, however, since your data is not in your CRM anymore, we might again come across your company and again contact you for direct marketing people uh, purpose because it's considered as direct marketing and so on and so forth. And because you are not anymore in our uh, CRM and you are not in our do not contact list, we might contact you again. Once again, as per your request, your personal data has been fully removed, but feel free to request a CRM update if you simply do not want to be contacted again. So this is to me the loop in the, in the basically GDPR that if I'm doing B2B sales and I have a process, if I remove someone from my CRM, 
and then I want to see this company again as an ICP, and this person is not in my CRM, I might just contact this person again. Uh, so that's a bit of a funny loop. Uh, we are using this for quite some time now, and um, and um, we have actually some people replying, like, yes, put me back in your do not contact list and you know, don't contact me anymore, right? So, uh, and which is funny because this means that you need to create a new person again in the CRM because you just did what you said and you removed and so on and so forth, right? Um, and um, yeah, so this is pretty much um, the guidelines that we did for the GDPR. You can, uh, we will share again this uh, document, this uh, uh, slide after the, after the webinars, and you can, of course, download uh, the e-guide. I also really, really like this link from Algolia, which made the GDPR way more searchable. Uh, so feel free to basically click on those links. And to conclude, basically, on uh, the GDPR plus outbound is that legitimate interest is not your get out of jail for free card, right? It's not because they say that in the recital 47 that you have legitimate interest to contact for direct marketing purpose that you should just put the legitimate interest flag everywhere. I think you still need to be very careful, document it, and have legit reason, obviously, to contact these people that uh, you can make some assumption that their pain basically match your painkiller. So yeah, so this was it for my part on the GDPR and outbound, and I think, Peter, you have some few comments on uh, example on how, what you do at Leadfeeder, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, so I wanted to highlight a few things. So one of the things is uh, I saw a question coming up earlier as well. Uh, where let me go back to it. So Susan was asking in regard to how, what if you get your information from Leadfeeder, and actually that's exactly what I wanted to talk a little bit about. We have a few minutes left. So what what JB was highlighting here was uh, make sure that you actually document your process. Like how do you get the information? How do you actually process it? Because, of course, you need to be able to, to prove anything if it gets to that point. Um, and that's where lead feeder contacts, for example, is very much uh, highlighted. So what, what many of you have, you have integrated your CRMs with lead feeder. You, uh, you, you pick up, you, you identify leads, and, and off of that, you want to create uh, entries into your CRM, right? So, and many times you, you pick up a um, potential contact from, from lead feeder contacts that we, that, we, that we provide. And of course, it's really important that you then, for example, have a custom field or in one way or another, uh, document that this is actually where the information came from. Because also, actually, another thing is that if, when a data process, said, then the data subject says, hey, stop, you know, delete me, you actually need to come back to us as well and say, hey, Guys, this guy does not want to be in any of those databases. You need to make sure to delete it. Uh, so that's quite important that that, that is properly documented. And um, I see a lot of chats coming in. Um, all right, yes, the, don't worry. In regards, you, you're getting everything. You're getting the slides. You're getting the, the, the recordings. No worries about that. So, uh, so in that in that sense, that that question, Susan, is is exactly answered here. So make sure that you that you document your your information exactly where where you got it from, so you can't get in trouble. You know, covering your ass, but still, it's it's healthy to uh, to kind of like know where did actually things come from. Because at the same time, if it's a prospect that you get back to after a long time, you might not necessarily remember how you got it. Right? Where did it come from? Like, was it somebody who talked to their neighbor, or was it actually someone who came in through lead feeder, for example? So, but then on another level, that's the next one. Um, JB, next slide, please. Merci beaucoup. So that's, for example, using LinkedIn. Now, of course, a lot of you uh, do do cold calling, do cold outreach, but at the same time, there's also another level to it because uh, one thing, for example, with uh, with, with Leafy is you can actually identify specific companies who have visited your website. Now, a lot of people ask us, hey please tell me exactly who it was that visited my website, which actually in the GDPR is quite illegal. Uh, so that's already, uh, that's, that's a very simple reason. But for another reason also, it's really handy to have the, just the company information because you're actually able to, to target your LinkedIn sponsored posts to particular companies. So that's where you actually can start thinking about account-based management. Uh, if you really want to start focusing on particular organizations or if you want to you know, go for a group of organization, group of companies in a particular market. Uh, and that, this is, so this is a screenshot from, for example, from, your, uh, from what's possible in, uh, in LinkedIn in regard to, to, to targeting. And this is really something to consider when you do your 
your uh, your 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 outreach uh, is that you focus that, um, and and this is where that can come in handy. So not necessarily avoiding the GDPR because of course social networks are they're not exempt, but they're they're in a in a different league when it comes to you know contacting because a lot of it is. In a way, uh, and then and there will be a lot of discussions on that public information. Um, but I'm sure the uh, and some people mentioned it already. The PECR or the uh, regulation on um, the e-privacy regulation that is that is still in the works. But this is a good example to kind of um, let's say it make it a little bit easier rather than than uh, uh, running into trouble right away. So focusing through, for example, uh, LinkedIn. Now, I have another question from Susan here. What if the information came from another source but augmented with lead feeder? Uh, then I would still, then I would actually maybe consider using, uh, using two, two fields here uh, because, of course, depending, but again, in, in the end, it depends on where the original personal data came from. Uh, so, mm -hmm. that, so consider where that actually, if the personal data came from another source, um, then it, it, you know, your custom field would, would, would clarify that. But if, of course, lead feeder uh, was the one who actually added the personal data on top of a, uh, on top of, a, for example, a company information, then of course it, it the source was lead feeder. So I think it's, it's very, the main dis differentiator is here. Where did the original personal data come from? I hope that answers the question. We have like a few minutes left. Uh, Great. So um, feel free to shoot any other questions as well regarding outbound and, and GDPRs, obviously. I can see some great uh, feedback on the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here's somebody asking, what is the relationship <laughs> between our two companies? Thanks, Sharon, for asking. Uh, the relationship is no other than that JB and I have worked together about five, six years yeah. ago. And uh, exactly. we, we kind of found each other again in a, in a discussion on on exactly this topic. Exactly. Yeah. It's uh, it's really that simple. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Naringa, for coming. Yes. Uh, no, Sharon. Uh, I, well, we are we have some people in the UK, but no. Uh, Hels originally, Lead Feeder is Helsinki based, but we have people everywhere, and and JB is located in uh, in Lithuania. <laughs> Great, um, and uh, yeah, I'm based in Vilnius, Lithuania, and uh, Julia, I also give workshop on how to do the French accent, so you can contact me if you like to I, I watched a lot of Allo Allo back in the day. I'm very good at it as well, if you need to, but bon. Great. Thank you, but everyone. Really, really glad you accepted, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Feel free to also connect on LinkedIn, Twitter, okay. and we'll share everything. Ciao. Connect, and uh, have a great day, have a great summer. Yeah, ciao. Thank you, Peter, again. Bye-bye.